Antiquity, how to set up and play. Antiquity is a civilization strategy game for two to four players. It's set in Italy during the Middle Ages. One of the unique things about the game is the players will set their own victory conditions by deciding which patron saint to, to dedicate their work towards. The challenge is to grow your civilization while balancing famine, pollution, and death. I'm going to cover setup, I'm going to cover the core concepts, and then we'll walk through each of the 10 phases of the game in detail. All right, the first part of setup is laying out the city world or the, the large city tiles. You'll always use two tiles for each player. So I've got this set up for a two player game. So I'm using four tiles. Uh, one tile will be for the starting city of one player, the starting city of the second player, and you'll have two tiles in between. Here's the illustration from the rule book that shows what I just did for a two-player game. If you had a three-player game, you'd have their starting city tiles on the outside with three in the middle. And in a four-player game, the four world tiles where the starting cities would go would be on each of the four corners with a diamond shape of four tiles in the middle. So again, it's always two tiles per player. So four and a two, six and a three, and eight tiles in a four-player game. The next thing we'll do is we'll seed the board with exploration tokens. Each of the large world tiles have two hexes marked with this explorer icon. So we'll take the stack of explorer icons, we'll actually sort out one of each type per player. So this is wheat, olives, sheep, and wine. So since this is a two-player game, I have one of each type for the first player and one of each type for the second player. So we won't use the rest in a two-player game. So I'll take these tiles, flip them over, shuffle them, and seed two on each tile. Okay, so now they were shuffled and placed face down on their sport corresponding hex on each tile, and these can be gained during the exploration phase of the game. So now let's cover the individual player pieces. So each player will get a player aid that show the phases of the game, all of the city buildings that can be built, the cost and the benefit, all of the countryside buildings that can be built, a chart of the goods, a listing of the different cathedrals dedicated to the various patron saints, and all of their housing buildings. So let's start there. So every player will put their set of houses. This is how you get workers in the building. So I've got workers. Uh, some people like to put the workers on the houses. I just have them on the side here so you can actually see the cost of the different houses. And you can see they're sequenced here because one of the patron saints lets you, when you build two houses, you get the lower number uh, for free. You can see the first four houses in the buildings can be built for free. Later houses will actually cost uh, money to build. So you lay out all the houses and the corresponding workers, 20 houses and 20 workers. Every player starts with six wood. That's the only starting resource you get. Every player will start with six wood tokens. You'll have the different city buildings that we'll cover in depth. You'll lay those out. Normally it's one per player that can be built with a couple exceptions. You can have multiple storage multiple carts, um, multiple fountains, multiple graves. So those are all the city buildings that we'll cover. You'll also have the city large tiles that go out into the world and we'll place that as part of setup. You've got the inns that extend the boundaries and the zone of control for the players and then you have additional city maps. So the initial city tile that gets placed on the board will correspond with this 7x7 seven seven city grid where you'll place city buildings. Later in the game, if, if and when another city is placed out into the world, the player will get another city grid where they can adi build additional buildings. Next you'll have a single famine track uh, that affects all the players. You'll set the starting famine level to zero. And then you've got markers for each of the players to indicate the turn order. 
and then you'll also have markers that will you be used to indicate which patron saint that they're dedicating their work towards. These get declared when a cathedral is built during the city building phase, so just leave these on the side of the board for now. One other point is that players can choose the same patron saint, so they're not exclusive. So during the city building phase when a cathedral is built, uh, multiple players can choose the same one. And in fact, there is a way you could destroy your cathedral and choose a new one later in the game. You'll set out all the resource chits, pollution chits, along with pasture tiles. And then you're ready to randomize start order and place the starting city tiles. All right, so next, randomize start player order. So red will be the start player. Yellow will be the second player. Placing your starting city is done in reverse player order. So we'll work backwards here. So yellow will actually choose first. So they will take their starting city tile. And keep in mind, these large world hexes, they were randomly placed here. They were shuffled. They're two-sided, so you could flip them over and, and place them randomly. But now, we're placing cities in reverse turn order. This player can now choose here or here. Remember, in a three-player game, you have the corners of the triangle, and in a four-player game, corners of the square. Um, this tile can be placed anywhere on the starting tile. The only restriction is it cannot cross the boundary. So it has to be fully contained within this first world map large hex. It can be placed over water. Um, later in the game, if you're building new cities, one of the rules is you cannot place your city on top of water. But the exception is for your starting city, you can actually place it on top of water. If you decided to cover one of the exploration tokens, it would just get removed from the game without looking at it. So both players will now choose their starting location in reverse turn order. So once all players have placed their starting city, you're now ready to start with the first phase of the game in turn order following all the different rounds of the game. Keep in mind most of the time the game can be played simultaneously and only if there's a conflict that arises because you're competing for the same area or so forth would you have to follow this strict turn order. And one of the ten phases of the game the turn order gets updated and it stays in effect until that same phase the next round. So let's cover the core concepts of the game now. So let's go over the four different types of land hexes. Uh, the first one is woods, you can see with the little trees. The second type of tile are pastures. The third type are mountains. And the fourth type are oceans or seas. So there's four types of land hexes in the game. If you look at the player aid, you can see the different types of goods in the game and we'll talk about which type of tile these goods come from. So let's actually move from right to left. So the first one is the woodcutter. So all the different forest tiles during the fields phase, if you were to place a woodcutter out there, those spaces would yield wood. And you can see that's considered a building material. And that's the only resource that comes from forest tiles. The mountains, those are the orange ones. There, you can actually build a mine, and a mine can yield one of two different types of resources. It can yield gold, which is considered a luxury good, or it can yield stone, which is considered a building material. Now, a single mountain range will ever only yield one type of resource. So the first player that builds a mine in this mountain range, and it's all connected, will declare whether this is a gold producing mountain range or a stone producing mountain range. One other important concept. Let's say a tile was placed, a city tile was built later in the game and it bisected this mountain range. That does not matter. This mountain range is still considered one range and it still will only ever produce stone or gold. So it's the first player that actually mines from this mountain range that declares what type of resource that range produces. The next tile were those sea tiles. If you build fishermen on the coasts or the shores of sea tile, 
they can actually yield resources from the water. So a fisherman can declare that the water is going to yield fish, which is considered a food, pearls, or dye, both of which are considered luxury goods. No building materials will ever come from sea tiles. So just like in the mountains, when a fisherman is placed on the water, they declare what type of resource is coming out. But unlike the mountains, the seas can change throughout the game. So once the fisherman has exhausted all the resources that they were adjacent to, that fishery is removed, and then that same player or another player can come, employ another fisherman to harvest from the water, and they'll place whatever tile they want to place for that specific fishery. Uh, the final type, these are the pasture fields, the green pastures, and you can build farms on the pastures. There are four types of farms. Three are considered food. Grain, olives, and sheep are food farms, and wine is a luxury good. There are no building materials that can come from the green pastures. These, the game will also reference seeds. These are considered seeds. So when you're planting a farm for the first time, you need a type of seed, and so it's either one of these four types of seeds, and by turning that in, you will create that farm that will produce one of these four types of resources. So these are the four types of buildings that can actually be placed on the land. And they're not really represented by specific tokens. It's typically you're sending out a worker and placing on a hex that's manning the farm, it's the fisherman, the mine, or the woodcutter. So there's four main types of um, buildings that get placed into the world that yield resources. And you can see these here, the fisherman, the woodcutter, the farm, and the mine. The other two types of things that you can build out into the world are brand new cities, like we did as part of setup. New cities can be placed on the board during the fields phase. And we can also place inns on the board. These are these inns and they'll extend our boundary of control. So th these are the different types of buildings that can be placed out in the world. Another important concept of the game is the idea of consumption or depletion of the land. So if a woodcutter was ever built on this hex here, and we'll talk about this when we get to countryside building, wherever the woodcutter is placed and all adjacent tiles would yield wood. But first, we lay down these pasture tiles to represent that we have torn down or, or cut down this forest in order to get that wood. And so the land has been depleted. And then part of the process is to actually put a wood tile on each of these. So in each round, these hexes will yield a wood, but it will leave behind an empty pasture. Now this empty pasture can then be subsequently used to build farms on. So whenever you build a woodcutter, the first thing you do is actually place pasture tiles to represent the depletion of the forest. For the other three types, the farms, the fishermen, and the mine, the first thing you do is when you build it, for example, you're going to put these pollution tiles to indicate that you have depleted resources from these hexes. So these will go on to mountain hexes, sea hexes, or pasture hexes. So you could in one turn tear down the forest to yield wood, which leaves them as pastures, and then on a subsequent turn decide I'm going to build a farm, so I'm going to deplete that and I'm going to make it a an olive farm and that resource will go there. We'll cover this in more depth, but it's important to remember that we're depleting the, the land of its resources. So forests turn to pastures, the other three, mountains, sea, and pastures, will turn into pollution once the resources are harvested. The next big concept to talk about is the zone of control. Basically, a player's zone of control is any area, specifically a hex, that the player can reach from their cities or inns. And to start the game, it's always two spaces away from your cities. So my zone of control, if this was my city, would be within two hexes or two steps.
So I could reach this hex, I could reach this hex. One thing to keep in mind is I can never travel over water as part of a step. So even though this hex is two away from this city, in order to get here, I would have to travel over one, two, three to get it. So it's not currently in my zone of control. So to start the game, the zone of control is always two hexes or two steps away from your cities and your inns. So we just mentioned inns. So inns are a way to extend your zone of control or the boundaries of your ZOC. So in a turn, I may send out a, a card and a worker to build an inn, two hexes away or two spaces, so I can build this within my zone of control. And now my zone of control is two from my city as well as two from any inns. So now these hexes are within my zone of control because they're two away from this inn that I've built. And you can build multiple inns to have access to different hexes in the game. Another way to extend your zone of control is to build a building called the stables and actually have it manned on a specific turn. A man stables increases your zone of control by plus one. So instead of two steps, your zone of control would be three steps away from all of your cities and your inns. One, two, three. So my zone of control could go out here if I had a man stables and I had built an inn right there. Now, from here, one, two, three, I could start reaching out to here with this city. One, two, three, I could not reach that fourth one, even with a man stables, because it's beyond. Um, still, I'm not allowed to consider water as part of my zone of control yet, but there's a way to change that. Another way to extend my zone of control is by building a harbor and having it manned on a specific turn. What a harbor does is for any body of water that's connected to your cities or any inns on the board, all that water is now considered part of your zone of control along with all the coastal hexes that are adjacent to that water. So if I build a harbor during the city phase and I have a worker to man it, for that instance, my now, now my zone of control, because I have a manned harbor, includes all of this along with all the coastal hexes. So my zone of control now all the way, goes all the way out to here. Since this water is connected, my zone of control I'd have, well this would already be within two, but you can see this hex. Now the plus two or the plus three doesn't apply, it's just the coastal hexes around this water. Now if my starting city tile was there, and I had a manned harbor, let's say it was there, that would now be within my zone of control because it's a coastal region connected to this water. Normally this would be one, two, three away, but this water is not connected to this city. So the manned harbor is giving me no benefit to this water because it's not connected to a city or an inn. One other concept is, remember we talked about countryside buildings and one of them is the fishermen. So when you're actually building a fisherman, you're actually building it on the land, and it has to be adjacent uh, to some sea hexes, and we'll talk about that. But if I wanted to build this fishery, as long as one of the hexes is in my zone of control, so let's say I'm building it there, one, two, that's in my zone of control, I can build that fishery, and now it can fish from all these adjacent hexes. It does not require me to have a manned harbor to actually get resources from these. Since the fishery was built within just my standard zone of control, I'm fine. I would just place pollution tokens here and then declare whether this is fish, pearls, or dye, place those tokens, and then once a turn during the harvest phase, I can take those resources off. If I had a manned harbor, that would just give me additional zone of control around here, and there's other ways that when we get to pollution tokens and so forth, the manned harbor will let me affect what's actually on these hexes in terms of placing pollution tokens, but the fishery is not dependent on having a manned harbor. One other point about zone of control, keep in mind it's always a temporary state of being. So depending on whether I have a harbor manned or not manned will affect my zone of control. 
There may be some turns where I, I've built a stable, but I decide not to man it. So my zone of control will only ever be plus two. So your zone of control will fluctuate throughout the game based on what ends you build, whether you have stables manned, uh, whether you have harbors manned. One thing to keep in mind, let's say I built a harbor and I manned it, so my zone of control now includes the water and all the adjacent hexes. So I decided to, let's say, build an inn right there since it's a coast adjacent to water. On a subsequent turn, I don't man my harbor. I don't lose this inn. I don't lose any countryside buildings. That's now permanent because when it was built, I had the zone of control. Now the zone of control you know extends to past my city. So now I can get to this explorer token or I can start building out here. I don't need to have a manned harbor to act. Once this is built, this is permanent on the land and now I can normal zone of control rules apply. There's a great diagram in the rule book that really illustrates zone of control well. So all the A hexes indicate kind of your starting zone of control. You'll see all the A hexes are within two spaces of the starting city. If this player was to build a harbor and man it, then for that round of the game, all the B hexes now would be within their zone of control. See this B hex before was three steps away, but now it's a coastline adjacent to water that's connected to their city. All the way out here, these are the coastlines of B. If they were to build an inn, this inn was in two spaces, so they could build this, and now the C hexes represent all the hexes that are two away from the inn. And then finally, if they were to also have a manned harbor, you can see the D hexes represent, I'm sorry, yeah, the ones marked with D represent additional zone of control from the inn that's connected to water, and then the manned harbor allows the water and all coastline hexes to be within the zone of control. So we've talked a lot about the countryside and the countryside buildings. Let's talk about the city buildings. Probably one of the most important city buildings are all of your 20 different houses because each house allows you to get an extra worker. And the first four houses are free. And then you can see the additional cost. So I'd have to pay one food to place this house onto my city grid and get an additional worker. And then you can see that as you go across the columns, the food price increases. One food, 2D means two different types of food, three different types of food, four different types of food. And as we go down, the number of luxury goods increase. So for this row, it's one luxury good. For this row, you can see the food, two different luxury goods, and this final row, three different luxury goods. So when you get all the way here to here, you need three different types of food and three different types of luxury goods to build this city. You can, I'm sorry, to build this house. You can build these houses in any order you choose. Maybe one turn you've got more luxury goods than you have different types of foods. So you may decide to build 10 um, before 14 based on the types of resources you have. Next, let's talk about the different city buildings. So the reason why houses and men are important because most of these city buildings require them to be manned. So I may build a house on my board that gives me a worker. And then we've talked about the harbor a lot. In order for the harbor to function properly, it requires me to man it with one of my workers. And this will repeat each phase. All of my workers will come back, and then I'll make new decisions based on the workers I have, which buildings to man, based on what do I want to accomplish that turn. Now, these are the buildings that actually don't require a man. And there's four types. Uh, the brewery. The brewery allows you to build inns. So by creating a brewery, all you need to do is have it on your board. You don't need it manned. And now you can build inns on the board. The cathedral. When you place the cathedral or build it, you immediately are going to declare which patron saint you're dedicating your work to. It will dictate what your victory conditions are and also what special power you have throughout the game. And that's where on the famine track you'll indicate your patron saint. The cathedrals do not need to be manned. The granary um, prevents 
uh, three famine when we get to the famine phase and it does not require to be manned and then fountains fountains will reduce uh, pollution during the pollution phase by one and then every time you build a fountain you can see there's multiple that can be placed the world famine track will actually get reduced so by building fountains you're helping all players in the game so these are the four types of buildings, obviously, along with houses. Houses get you men. These are the four types of city buildings that do not require a man placed on them for their power uh, to be active. Once the building is placed, their power is present. And most of the time, you'll actually see that on the player aid. So the granary that we talked about, you can see the hex shape, the cost of one wood to build it during the city phase, the power it provides, it prevents three famine during the famine phase, and then it says in parentheses, no man needed. Again, no man needed for the cathedral we talked about. Everything else, all of these, assume that they require a man in order to operate. So let's go through them quickly. So these are the city buildings that will not function unless they're manned. And another reminder, most city buildings can ever only be built once by a player. And there's only one of them. There are a couple of exceptions. We've talked about a few of them. Fountains. There can You can build multiple fountains. You can obviously build multiple houses to get more workers. You can build multiple carts. And we'll talk about carts next. And you can build multiple storehouses. The other item that you can have multiple of are grays, but you really don't build those. You receive those as penalties. So let's go through these now. So we've talked a lot about interacting with the world to build these countryside buildings and new cities and inns. The only way you can ever interact with the world is by having a man cart. So that's what a cart allows. When you have a man cart on your board and you place a worker on it, basically you're saying, I want to send this worker out into the world to accomplish some mission. So you'll always make sure that you at least reserve the resource he needs to build whatever building he wants to build out into the world. So that's why you can have multiple carts in the game. Because you may send multiple workers out into the world, each on their own man cart, to accomplish different missions. The stables we've talked about, that increases your zone of control, plus one. Forced labor. When forced labor is man, manned, it will allow you to take three resources, up to three resources, from a single harvester. So we'll talk about this when we talk about the phases, but if this was seeded with wood, normally you could ever only take one off. If you have forced labor, you take three off instantly. The downside is the first one always gets discarded to the game. So if there were only two resources left and you manned forced labor, you would take them both off, but the first one would get discarded. If there was only one resource left, the final resource from that worker, unfortunately that would get discarded and you wouldn't get to keep it. So that's the benefit of the forced labor is it allows you to harvest resources faster from the land. The explorer, by putting a man on the explorer during the um, fields phase, it allows you to send that worker, as long as within the zone of control, to discover these exploration tokens and claim the resource benefit. We've talked about the harbor. A manned harbor increases your zone of control to include water and the adjacent coastal hexes. A dump during the pollution phase uh, prevents the, the placement of a, up to four pollution. Normally you're required to place three pollution tiles per city if you have a dump. Uh, that saves you from placing four of them. Also, it prevents other players from polluting within your zone of control. So sometimes players will start butting up against each other and share a zone of control. This prevents them from placing any pollution into your zone of control. A manned market, remember these need to be manned, a manned market allows you to trade goods with other players uh, during the city building phase. It also allows you to trade with the game. You can trade in any two goods and take any resource of your choice from the game. There's multiple storage. This allows you to store goods on your game board. When you're building storage, you can build as many as you'd like for the cost. So one wood, if I wanted to, I could only build one, or I could pay, again, just one wood and build as many as I like. 
the only requirement is they have to form a rectangle. So you could have a very long rectangle that cost me one wood to build, or you can do a simple square rectangle. Keep in mind, the storage has to be manned. So if I built one that size, it's still, this only requires one man, and then it gives me one, two, three, four, five, six squares of storage. One square for each of the underlying spots. If later in the game I wanted to add storage here, it's considered a separate storage building that requires its own man in addition to this. Even if I added onto this, this would be considered separate. It's only when they're built together do you get the benefit of the single resource cost and one man to man the storage buildings. The hospital, once manned, allows you to remove up to five graves from your city map. So your city map is going to get start getting clogged up with graves uh, during the famine phase and possibly even the pollution phase. A hospital is one way to get graves removed from the game. And now you've got your buildings of higher learning. So let's cover these. The Faculty of Theology allows you to destroy a cathedral you may have built if you change your mind on your patron saint. Biology, when manned, gives you a virtual free seed. If you send a man car down to the world to start a new farm, you don't need to send the seed with them. The biology will actually give you a free seed of your choice. Philosophy allows you to ignore the D in terms of different resource costs. So this building, the stables, would only cost you two luxury goods if you have a manned building of philosophy. And the alchemy building during the countryside building allows you to instantly remove pollution uh, from the world. It allows you to select a tile within your zone of control and then all adjacent tiles that are polluted would get cleaned. Finally, there's the university that it doesn't have any power by itself, but when a university is manned, any additional faculty that's adjacent to it will also be manned. So if you only have it adjacent to one, there's obviously no benefit, but once it's adjacent to two, you can use one man to activate multiple faculty buildings. So those are all the city buildings that can go on your hex. We'll cover them in a little bit more detail as we go through the different phases. All right, let's cover the sequence of play in detail. So at a high level, each round is played in 10 phases, 10 phases where everyone gets their workers back. They come off the buildings. We build new buildings in our city and man those buildings. We reset turn order. We take our manned carts out into the countryside and interact with the land. We store remaining goods or discard if we don't have storage. We harvest based on all of our producers out on the land. We can explore with a manned explorer building. During the famine phase, we'll get graves based on the famine level. During the pollution phase, we'll add pollution to our zone of control based on the number of cities we have. And then finally, we check for victory. And then each round is repeated with these 10 phases. So the very first phase is very short. The all rise phase, we basically take all workers off of our city buildings. At the beginning of the game, we won't have any workers to take off buildings, but in subsequent rounds, we will. And it's important to keep in mind that men only come off of city buildings. Any workers we have out on the countryside will stay there until they harvest their final resource and only then will they come back for future rounds. So anyone manning fisheries, woodcutters, farms, and mines will stay there until their work is done. The next phase is the city phase and this is where a lot of the involvement in the game happens. Basically, we'll be deciding which buildings to build. You can, you can build as many as you have the resources and the area in your city map to build, and then you can decide which of those buildings you want to man with your available workers. So probably the most important type of building, because it gives you your workers, are your houses. So you can build these on the board, and you can see the cost listed. You can build these in any order. For every house you build, you have an available worker that you can use to man city buildings or buildings out in the countryside. This phase is meant to be done in secret. So if you want to use player screens or an honor system, it's important that you perform all your actions because based on the number of manned carts and explorers you have, that'll influence turn order in a subsequent phase. So let's talk about the main buildings during the city phase 
that actually have relevance immediately in the game. And probably the big one is the cathedral. Once a player builds the cathedral, you can always find the resource cost at the back of the building. Once the player builds the cathedral, they must declare which patron saint it is dedicated to. And that'll dictate their win conditions as well as the special powers in the game. So let's go over these. A cathedral dedicated to St. Niccolo, you must have all 20 men, which means you've built all of your houses. The bonus you get once, you, once you've built your cathedral to this saint is that when building two houses, you get the lowest number for free. So basically, if you build 14 and pay that food, you can add in any of the other houses for free without paying the resource cost. San Giorgio, your win condition is to have all other area of another player in your own zone of control, basically surrounding that player, which means that you can reach every hex. Every hex within their zone of control is also within your zone of control. The bonus is you gain a fish, and this will happen during the fields phase. You'll gain a fish for every cathedral built that round. So normally, only one cathedral is allowed to be built per player, so you'll only ever gain one fish per player for the, entire of the game, entirety of the game, unless a player decides to tear down their cathedral uh, using the theology power and rebuild it, then you'd get an extra fish for that. Santa Barbara, you win the game if you're able to build every single building at least once. Uh, graveyards don't count because you don't build graveyards, you get them as a penalty. Um, and your power is you can rearrange buildings on your grid. So that's an important point. Whenever you build buildings, you have to build them right side up. You can't build them on the upside down phase. They have to be right side up. You can freely rotate them, but once they're set in place, you are no longer allowed to destroy them, move them, or anything. The Santa Barbara power allows you to break that rule and you can always freely rearrange your building. In fact, cathedrals are the only building that you do have the ability to destroy if you man the theology. San Cristofori, you have to have three of each food and luxury good in your possession. So three grain, three olives, three sheep, and three fish. Those are the food and three wine, three pearls, three dye, and three gold. If you have three of each of the food, all the foods and all the luxury goods at the end of phase 10, you would have satisfied the win condition. The power of this saint is you can store any amount of goods in your cathedral. You do not need extra storage to store goods, so you have unlimited. Santa Maria, you have to satisfy two of these win conditions, which is more difficult, obviously, but... Your ability is you get the special power of all saints. So when you dedicate your cathedral to Santa Maria, you get everyone's powers, but you have to satisfy win conditions. And as a rule, uh, once you dedicate your cathedral to Santa Maria, you are not allowed to use the theology building to destroy it. That's the only exception. You are locked into her. Finally, the nice thing about the cathedral is it never needs to be manned. Once built, you always have the power based on your saint. Another building that has relevance during this phase when built is the market. So a market needs to be manned. Once it's manned, you're allowed to trade with other players, whatever you can agree to, or you can trade two to one with the game. Any two goods on this table for any one of your choice using the market, and you can do that any number of times freely um, once you've manned the market. But the actual trading only takes place during phase two, during the city building phase. So make sure you trade for the right resources that you need in subsequent phases, phases like the uh, fields phase. We've talked about the theology building. If you man the theology building, you're allowed to destroy a previously built cathedral. And then if you have the resources, you can immediately rebuild the cathedral and rededicate it to a different saint, or you can do that on a subsequent turn. Another building that obviously has relevance during this phase is the faculty of philosophy, because it allows you to ignore the different building requirements for different buildings. Another building during phase two is the hospital, 
the hospital, once it's manned, obviously built and then manned, you can immediately remove five graves from your city. So graves may have been placed in subsequent famine or pollution rounds in empty spots or on top of buildings which render, render them useless. This allows you to free out five graves from any of the city maps that you control. So that's the hospital. It's important to remember that during this phase, you can do any of these buildings and manning of buildings in any order you choose. So you may have a city tile that's f completely full, a city map, and your first action may be to man a hospital that you had on the board to free up some graves, to free up some room. Then you can decide to build a house that gives you additional workers and so forth. So you can do this in any order of your choosing. The last one we'll mention in phase two here are the carts. So you may build a couple carts because during the fields phase, this will, will, what will allow you to interact with the world. So you may decide to man two of your carts. Maybe there's nothing you need to trade this round. So you're not going to man that and you're not going to man this. And so you would just have two workers left over for a future round. Make sure that obviously you can build as many buildings as you can afford based on their cost and that you can fit, but make sure you reserve resources that these workers may need as they go into the countryside to build what they need to build also. After the city building phase, we're going to reset player order. So players with the smallest number of manned cart shops and explorers will play first. So you'll check and count your number of manned explorers and carts. So in this situation, this player has three. And then if that was the fewest number of all players, we would reset turn order and they would go first. And then whoever had the second lowest number of carts and explorers would go next. If it was tied, you just retain the turn order placement from the previous round between those players. And then finally, keep in mind, it's manned carts and explorers. So if I decided not to man this explorer, I would only have two manned carts and explorers, and that would be the number used to gauge where I go in turn order. In subsequent rounds, this turn order is going to be maintained for all phases until it gets back to phase three, and then it gets reset. So when we get to the next phase, the fields phase, whoever's first will perform all their actions in the fields phase, all of their manned carts, before the second player is able to go. The next phase of the game is the fields phase. Basically, all of your manned, every player's manned cart can now interact with the countryside to build countryside buildings. Countryside buildings are the four types of producers, fishermen, woodcutters, farms, and mines, along with the building of inns and cities. So let's talk about each of these now. The four different types of resource producers have to be placed um, into the corresponding hex, so woodcutters in the forest and so forth. Uh, the hex that you choose has to be within your zone of control and it has to be empty and unpolluted. And then based on your choice, you'll pop up, populate hexes around it um, with the proper amount of either pollution tokens, pasture tiles, and then resources. So let's look at the woodcutter first. So I've set up a couple different examples here. So let's say this player wanted to build a woodcutter on this hex. And so let's say their zone of control is two. So they're two steps away, so they can freely choose that hex, assuming it was not polluted and it was empty. If there was a pollution token there or another resource from a different harvester was there, they could not choose that hex. They would, since this is a woodcutter, they would put a pasture tile at the bottom of all adjacent hexes because we're cutting down the trees and then you would put a resource token on top of every adjacent hex. So like, since I pick that adjacent forest, 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 this is also forest. So, so even though there was an explorer token there, this would get discarded without looking. And then we would add a pasture tile and a wood token. Now these tiles are also adjacent, but they're not the forest type. Those are mountains. So those, even though this is adjacent, 
to my woodcutter, it would not get a pasture tile and a wood token. Um, it also doesn't matter that this tile is outside of my zone of control. You can see it's three steps away. It only matters where I actually place the woodcutter as long as that's within my zone of control. All adjacent hexes that are of the right type, the forest type, and are empty and unpolluted get affected by the woodcutter I built. Okay, so now let's talk about the mines and you can see all the costs to build these resources. So the woodcutter costs one wood. A mine would cost one wood to build. So here I've chosen this hex. You can see I've picked one with a mountain tile. So all adjacent mountain tiles. Here there's only one because everything else around it is forest. For, for mines, for farms, and for fisheries, the resource tokens always have a pollution token underneath them to indicate that once this is harvested, the land was consumed and cannot be reused until that pollution token is removed. So for a mine, you place the pollution token and then you also declare the resource. So mines can produce either stone or gold. So since I, I was the first one, first player to access this mountain range, I declared it would be a stone producing mountain range. Next, next, let's talk about the farm, which requires a seed. A seed for a farm is either a grain, olive, sheep, or wine. So as long as you have one of those resource tokens available to you, you can start a farm of that variety. The other way you can do it is if you have biology on your board and manned. That gives you a free virtual seed of any of those four types to start a farm. Either way, you still need a manned cart along with a manned cart to go out into the world and either discard the seed token or have a manned biology building. So in this case, let's say I discarded a wheat token. I picked a hex that was two away. Actually, that's three away. So I could not go there unless my zone of control was increased. This hex is within two. So I used a wheat seed. I put pollution tokens. And then for any adjacent green tile or pasture tile that was empty and unpolluted, I can place the pollution tile and then the resource token to be harvested. The last type of um, resource harvester is the fisherman. It takes one wood to build and then what you do is you take this fisherman tile and you place it adjacent to water hexes. So at least one end of the tile has to be within your zone of control. So one, two, you could place it. Even if this hex was outside the zone of control, that'd be okay as long as one half of the tile was within your zone of control. Now, both sides of the fishery have to be adjacent to sea hexes. You couldn't just do that and only have one adjacent. You'd have to do both. And at least one of them has to be unpolluted. So it has to have access to some type of fresh resource. You could always put a fishery on top of polluted tiles. And then for any adjacent sea tile, it would now get a pollution tile and you would declare whether it's gonna harvest fish, pearls, or dye. So I've selected pearls here. Now when the fishery has completed its harvest at the end of four phases, harvesting one good per phase, the fishery would come off, but the pollution would remain. So this land was still consumed. But since the fishery, and the way I like to think about it, the fishery isn't really using the land resources to harvest, it's just setting up its operation there. It's actually harvesting from the sea tile, so that's the one that get the pollution tiles when you build a fishery. So the nice thing about the fishery is you only need the wood uh, to build it, the fisherman. You don't need the corresponding thing like you do a, to seed a farm. You just basically declare what resource that you'll be harvesting. You also don't need a manned harbor because the land hex was within your zone of control. So as long as you can place the fishery on a hex that's within your zone of control, you can still harvest the adjacent sea tiles. If you did have a manned harbor, that would give you access to the water and the coastline, so you could have actually put your fishery right here and access these 
fish tiles. Maybe these got polluted and you wanted to get access to these, so you man a harbor to place here to go there. All right, so those are the four resource types. Also, a man cart can let you build an inn. It costs one food to build a man cart. I'm sorry, so if you had a man cart and you also had a food, you can build an inn. Basically, an inn extends your zone of control. So the inn just has to be built within your zone of control. So if you have a zone of control of two, you could build an inn right there for that one food. Inns can be built over pollution. Since inns can't be removed, you might as well just discard the pollution at that point. But you could have an inn there, and now that extends your zone of control. Couple reminders. Remember to even build an inn, you need to have a brewery on your board. Breweries don't need to be manned, but you would have had to build one. Inns don't need to be manned. So you needed a manned cart to come build this inn, but you don't need to have a cube on that. This inn now acts by itself, gives you the power without having to have a worker on it. The last major thing you can build during the fields phase, if you have a manned cart, you can send him out to build a brand new city. It takes a wood, a stone, a food, and two different uh, luxury items, and you can build a new city hex. So a couple rules. Um, cities cannot be directly adjacent to any existing cities, yours and other ones. At least one hex of the city has to be within your existing zone of control. And cities cannot be placed over water. Remember at the beginning of the game they could be placed, but during later rounds they cannot be placed over water. They can be placed over pollution tiles. So you may have a bunch of pollution here and decide as long as that was within your zone of control, let's say right there, one, two, three. So right now it's out of my standard zone of control, but let's say I had a man stables that gave me a plus one. So now that hex is in my zone of control. I could place it right there even on top of pollution. Once I place a new city tile, that gives me access to a new city grid that I can start building new buildings on top of. But that example brings up a good point. You can do countryside building just like city building in any order you want. So you may decide first to you know, build an inn somewhere. Let's say we're the red player here. I decide to build an inn here that extends my zone of control. So two from here would get my zone of control. Let's say the inn was right there. Now my zone of control goes out to here, and now I can build a new city here as long as it wasn't over the water. Again, if it covers an explorer token, you just discard that from the game. So you can do your countryside building in any order you want based on your strategy. So during the fields phase, when your building's in the country, buildings like the stables and harbors, if they're manned, are important because they affect your zone of control temporarily to allow you to build new buildings. Also, the biology building gives you a virtual seed if you're sending a cart out to build a farm. Uh, the brewery gives you the ability to build inns on the board. And then one final building that's important during the country building phase is the faculty of alchemy. During the country building phase, if you have the alchemy building, you can be, it can be used to clear pollution. So basically, you would just choose a hex within your current zone of control, and then it has to be a polluted hex, and then all adjacent hexes would have their pollution removed. So even if, let's say, there was pollution oops, here, here, and here, this hex is within your zone of control. If you choose this one, all adjacent pollution to that one get removed even if you didn't have a manned harbor. Now if you did have a manned harbor, then all of a sudden, let's say this situation, this hex is within your zone of control with a manned harbor. So you can choose to remove this one and then all adjacent pollution would be removed. So that happens if you have a manned alchemy building. The next phase is the store goods phase. So any goods you didn't use for city building or fields building can now be stored. So 
Obviously, one good can be stored per square in a manned storehouse. Or, if you have St. Christophori, you can store unlimited in the cathedral. All other goods are discarded that can't be stored during this phase. The next phase is the harvest phase. So for each countryside building, your woodcutters, mines, farms, and fisheries, you can harvest one good per building. And you can, player can choose freely which good to harvest with the exception that the good underneath the worker has to be harvested last. So they could take one from here, 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 uh, and here. And only when it's the final good can they take from there. The one building that affects this phase is the forced labor. If it's manned, you can take three goods. In fact, you have to take three goods from the worker. The first one is always discarded to the game. So it's a way to harvest more resources, but you lose one. If there were only two left, the first one would get discarded and you would get one. If there was only one good left, that would get forced to be discarded. And the forced labor, if it's manned, affects all of your countryside buildings in the same way. All of your har harvested goods go to your harvested goods box. Any workers that were on the map that harvested their final resource come to this box. And it's actually in this phase that if you have the San Giorgio uh, saint, you would get a fish for every cathedral that was also built during this round. Also keep in mind that zone of control does not matter for harvesting resources just for when you originally built uh, the countryside building. The next phase is the explorer phase. Any player that has a manned explorer building can explore one uh, explorer token in the round. So let's look at the red player. They have a manned explorer. So that explorer can be used to go within the zone of control. So two hexes, they can discover this token. It's going to be one of the four types of seed. If it's grain, olives, or sheep, it's going to have a red arrow, meaning you immediately increase the famine track. This affects all players. If it's wine, it won't have that red arrow. So the player will discard the Explorer token, and they'll get the corresponding resource token into their harvest box. The next phase is the Famine phase. You're going to add graves to your city equal to the current Famine level. If you have a granary, which doesn't need to be manned, you get a 3 discount. And then also for every food you have, you get a discount. Keep in mind, the food does not need to be discarded. It'll just count against the Famine. Graves will be added on empty spots. If there are no empty spots, you've got to place them on buildings. So this explorer could have three graves on it. Once the first grave goes on it, the building no longer functions. If you're unable to place graves in any of your city maps, um, it's one way you can get eliminated from the game. At the end of the famine phase, you always increase the famine level up by one. And one last requirement, you are not allowed to put graves on top of houses. The next phase is pollution. So for every city the player has, they have to add three pollution tokens per city. If they have a manned dump, it's a four discount. And for every fountain, which doesn't need to be manned, it's a one discount. And they have to add those pollution tokens within their zone of control. Hex is within their zone of control. If you have a manned dump, it also protects you from other players polluting within your zone of control. If you're unable to place pollution tokens, if there are no legal hexes, they have got to be empty, unpolluted hexes, then you have to add graves to your city instead. Increasing your zone of control will give you more options during the pollution phase. Finally, we check for victory, and if someone satisfied their victory conditions, they win the game. In the case of a tie, the player with the largest number of unpolluted hexes within their zone of control wins the game. And that's everything you need to set up and play Antiquity.